What are mistakes to avoid when trying to recruit advisors to join your RIA? That is today's question on the Transition to RIA question and answer series. It is question number 68. Hi, I'm Brad Wales with Transition to RIA, where I help you understand everything there is to know about why and how to transition to the RIA model. Uh, if you're not already there, if you head to transitiontoria.com, you can find all of the resources I make available, including this entire series in video format, uh, podcast format. I have white papers. I have articles. Uh, and again, as I mentioned uh, on the podcast, if you are more of a podcast fan and you're currently watching this on video, uh, if you search for the Transition to RIA podcast uh, on all major podcasts and platforms, you will be able to find the show. Okay, again, transition to RIA.com. All right, on today's episode is a topic uh, that, that, I, that I discuss with a lot of advisors that are either not currently in the RIA model and, and are planning to transition to it, which is, which is the bulk of the, uh, the advisors I'm working with, uh, or in, in some instances, advisors that already have their own RA. But in either circumstance, part of their vision is to grow their firm, grow their practice in part by not only the organic growth with their existing clients and prospective clients, but also to attract advisors in to want to join their RIA uh, and, and bring their clients and, and kind of grow together. I've done a whole episode on why as an advisor, you might want to join an existing RA versus start in your own. So if you're not familiar with that, certainly check out that episode as well. But in this case, if you are the advisor on the RIA side, you are the one trying to attract advisors, trying to bring advisors into your firm. Uh, there's a number of things you need to be considering as part of that process. And so on today's episode, I want to go over seven mistakes that I see RIAs making as they as they attempt to to attract advisors to their firm, and again, to the degree you are thinking about transitioning to that RA model or are already there, if this is part of your vision, I encourage you to consider these seven items and, and how you can avoid them. Uh, and these are no no particular order here. So the first mistake, mistake number one, you do not have a defined offering. And so what I mean by this is you you need to put pencil to paper and really think through the, the, the nuts and bolts of what your offer will be. So are the advisors that are gonna join your firm, are they gonna be 1099 or are they gonna be W2? Uh, are you gonna provide office space for them? Uh, are you open to all geographies or would you like to keep it just local or a particular region? Uh, how are you going to price your services, which I'll get into in a moment. So you, you really have to have that kind of a defined offer and figured out because a theme you'll hear me say as we go through these mistakes is, is you can't be everything to everyone. And that will be very obvious if you are trying to be everything to everyone. And, and as they say, if you're everything to everyone, you're, you're everything to no one. So uh, you do need to put pencil to paper and figure out, okay, what is the ideal setup that would work for me as the RIA? Uh, and what do I think would be most attractive for the advisors that might want to join my RIA? Uh, and, and what can I deliver on? So again, things like, are they 1099W2? Will you provide an office? What geographies are you open to? What size advisors are you open to? Uh, and how are you going to price out the services? That sort of thing. Defined offer, and you need to have that right out of the gate. So mistake number two is related to this. So you uh, have a mistake number two is you have a weak value proposition. And so what I mean by that is let's say you do have uh, kind of a defined offering in, in, in your head and hopefully you put it on paper and, and sketched it out. And you, you are in a situation where you, you're able to have a conversation with an advisor that might be interested in joining your firm. And, and they ask you, why should I join your firm? You know, perhaps why should I join your firm over someone else's or why should I join your firm over starting my own? You need to have a good polished answer for that. It's, it's the same thing that you have developed and I'm sure refined over time with investor clients that come to you, prospective clients that come to you when, when they sit down and you're helping them and they might ask, okay, why, why should I bring my business to you? Why are you the best person to help me? You, you probably have a nice eloquent way of explaining your value proposition, explaining why you feel you are best to provide for that particular investor client. You need to have the same, whether you want to call it an elevator pitch or however you want to phrase it, you need to be able to articulate 
what your value proposition is as an RIA. And again, you, you can't be everything to everyone. So you need to have a both a defined message. And then I would also tell you to, to avoid just using cliche answers. So an example of that is if an advisor says, well, why should I join your firm? If your answer is, well, we concentrate on great service and we provide great service to our clients and to our advisors. Here's the deal. Every RIA on the planet says that. Now, whether they actually deliver on it is, is obviously uh, debatable and some surely do more than others. But the reality is that every, every RIA says they provide great service. So if that is your value proposition, oh, we provide great service, well, just know every other option out there available is saying the, is, is, is either saying it or demonstrating the same thing that they, they provide great service. And again, whether they're actually delivered on it is a different topic, but you need a better value proposition than just some kind of generic cliche statement about how, how we provide great service. So I encourage you to kind of think through how can your message resonate? How can you be different from someone else? And so I'll just give you a couple examples I've come across over time. And, and you don't have to super narrowly define your your angle, but it, it, it certainly helps them to explain your firm. So I've come across RAs that say, hey, we focus on DFA Vanguard style advisors. Uh, and and that's, a, that's our lane and we stay in our lane. And if, if someone's, if that's not their investment philosophy, hey, that's fine. We're not a good home for them. If that is, we are the best at providing for that type of advisor. Other firms might uh, focus on female advisors or advisors in certain occupation or clients that have certain occupations or advisors uh, at a certain stage in their career. Maybe you are a landing spot for people that are five years away from wanting to uh, have a succession out, and that is your value proposition. So again, pick your lane, stay in your lane, and be able to articulate how you are different. So again, that's your value proposition. Uh, mistake number three, you price your offering out as a payout. So what I mean by this is you're going to have your defined offering, like I talked about, you're going to have a, a way to articulate it with your value proposition. And of course, you have to price this out. That's an important part of the equation. And in the RIA world, for those that are not already in it, it is quite a bit different, thankfully, in many ways than the broker-dealer world. So in the broker-dealer world, every advisor that's either in that world or has been in that world, of course, knows the payout is the typical compensation arrangement. Uh, every dollar that comes in, you get maybe an employee channel, 40% or an independent channel, some, some higher percent, uh, and then the firm keeps the rest. Uh, some, some RA firms still kind of price it that way, but the majority that I've come across uh, that, that are attracting advisors, and they do the inverse. As, so as opposed to saying perhaps, okay, advisor, uh, here's our defined offer and here's our value proposition, here's everything you get. As opposed to saying, oh, and we give you an 85% payout, the more typical uh, arrangement in the RIA model is to do the inverse of that, to say, hey, here's everything we provide and we charge, and it's, it's actually typically in basis points more so than a percent of revenue, though you could do either one. But uh, an example would be, here's everything we provide and we charge for that 15 basis points. Now, I think this is a much cleaner way to look at uh, any sort of uh, affiliation arrangement. I, I think this is how wirehouse firms should do it. Independent broker dealer firms should do it. I've, I've ranted about that in a lot of uh, these episodes and articles that it's the inverse that matters. So basically what you're saying as a firm saying, hey, we've packaged up these services. Uh, advisor, you are going to need these services to be able to do your job with your clients. So you as you, you could go out there and start your own firm and, and, and uh, put those together yourself and, and build that out yourself. Or, hey, we've, we've bundled it up as an RIA and we'd love to have you join us for all the reasons. Here's our value proposition. We've bundled it up. And for this, we charge you X percent or X basis points typically. Again, maybe it's 15 basis points. And so advisor, you keep 100% of the fees that you bring in we provide you these services, we charge 15 basis points. And that's a much cleaner way to appreciate, or not for that matter, the value that a firm has provided you as a join-in advisor. And so that's why I think wirehouses should do this, independent broker dealers should do this, uh, because they are providing service. That wirehouse is providing you, if you're at a wirehouse firm now, an office, uh, most likely they're providing you for better or worse compliance support, likely some sort of staff, maybe some benefits. Uh, so they are providing you value and they're charging for it. But as opposed to kind of actually putting a price tag on what they're charging you, they're, they're, 
they're doing just the typical payout rate. So I think what's better in it, this is what happens in the RA space. You say, here's what we provide. Here's what we charge. You keep 100%. We charge X basis points or, or sometimes maybe X percent of revenue. Um, so just know that's that's the more typical way of pricing out an offer in, in the RA space. Again, put pencil to paper. You do need to have that defined and ready to go if an advisor you're trying to attract to your firm asks you about that. Uh, and related, you can you can get creative on this front. So I've seen some RAs that will have maybe two packages and they'll say, hey, uh, for uh, these sets of services, we charge 15 basis points. And over here, we have kind of the, uh, the if that's the base package, this is the base plus package. And it provides everything in the base package, but also these additional services. And that's 20 basis points. An advisor, we're agnostic. You decide which package is most helpful to you or will provide the services that you feel you will need. Uh, and, and we're fine either way, whichever one you want to pick. So you, you can get creative in how you price these, but I would encourage you to strongly consider in price, uh, pricing them in the inverse of the typical payout. Because again, that's, that's how most RAs do it. Not all, there are, also, there are some RAs that, that still feel that they can best position it as you know, a more typical payout in 80%, 90%, however they want to phrase it. Uh, and that's fine. Again, as long as your value proposition can be justified by your price and you can be comfortable with how you message it, you, you can kind of do it however you want. Just from, from what's out there, they'll know that most firms kind of do this inverse and most of them uh, often express it in, in basis points, not necessarily a percent of revenue. But again, you can do it however you want. You just have to have this defined. You have to have this ready to explain to any advisor you might be talking to. Okay, mistake number four. Let's say you kind of get past uh, some of these initial hurdles that I just talked about. You need to have an organized process for how you're going to attract an onboard advisor. So this is the exact same thing you as an advisor are currently doing uh, with prospective investor clients. So, so how are you going to message out your value proposition as a firm? Uh, how are you going to attract advisors to maybe want to have conversations with? And, and then when you do have conversations, what, what is your process for helping them uh, learn, do, do, for them to do their due diligence on your offering and learn about your, your value proposition? Uh, and, and I would map that out. I, I don't assume that just one lunch meeting uh, with an advisor and then you're going to explain everything they could possibly need to know that that's absolutely not going to be the case. Now, it might start with a lunch or an informal meeting uh, with an advisor you're trying to attract, uh, but, but that alone is not going to convince them, nor should it, of, of your value proposition and all that you have to offer because that takes time to demonstrate in many instances. So maybe you have a, a defined process where you say, hey, we have, we have a series of three meetings or three phone calls or, or three Zooms or whatever the case is that we like to do with advisors. The first is maybe a, an informal kind of get to know each other, uh, explain the value proposition, blah, blah, blah. The second one is maybe a deeper dive on the, the technology offering, the service offering, the operation offering. And then, and then the third is a is a deep dive on what you do as an RA to help them transition over. So you, you have to, one, just for operational reasons, have this defined process for how to attract and onboard advisors. And it's equally, to, to, to be able to successfully do it, you need to have it. Uh, but then uh, equally important to instill confidence in advisors that you might be trying to attract to your firm. You, this is their livelihood. This is their practice. And if they like your value proposition, they like your price and like everything you have to offer, you have to give them confidence that you will help them successfully navigate into your practice. And you need to be able to demonstrate that, again, with an organized process. Uh, and, and you show that from the very moment you start talking to them, even when it's just that, hey, learning more about your practice through, hey, what would be actual steps of onboarding you and your clients into the practice? Uh, mistake number five, you, you don't explicitly state that uh, joint advisors will have ownership of their client relationships. So that's a fancy way of saying the advisor will own uh, their book, they'll own their, their, their clients. Um, and the exception to this is if your uh, firm, if your RA, if your value proposition is such that you are acquiring practices, you go, hey, anyone that joins our firm, part of our value proposition is we, we acquire your practice perhaps for succession needs. Um, that, that's, that's a different scenario. Uh, another scenario might be if you have some sort of partnership uh, kind of arrangement or that's how you're structured. So everyone that comes in is, is now kind of a partner of this larger firm and, and the equity is kind of split. So there are some scenarios where clearly if you are buying a book of business 
At that point, it is going to be owned by the RIA, or if there's a partnership situation, now you're kind of uh, equal partners or, or, or however the partnership is split up. That could be a little different, but if 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 it's a uh, an arrangement where, for instance, okay, no joint advisors are 1099, and here's the services we provide, and here's how we price it out, you do need to make it explicitly clear to them that that they retain the client, uh, the ownership of the client book of business, and on the chance that they ever one day wanted to leave, they are free to do so and free to take their clients with you. And the reason I say you have to do this because that is what advisors demand and, and should get. So again, unless you are buying their practice or making them part owner, part or partnership, whatever the case is, you, you cannot expect someone to join your firm and, and at some just arbitrarily give up the ability to one day take their clients elsewhere and, and have never received any, any compensation for the ownership of that practice. And so, so put it in writing because advisors are going to expect that advisors deserve to see that. And, and what I would do as, as the RAs as you explain that, you say advisor, hey, we treat the advisors that join us, the advisors that are with us as free agents. That's how we think of you. And, and so we know that in any given year, any given day, month, whatever you want to use, uh, you could, if you wanted to leave us, you could, and you could take all your clients with us and, and we will do nothing to stop you. And so as a result, we as the RA have a responsibility to provide you good value for a good price every single day to make you so you don't ever want to leave. And you say, hey, this is a good firm for me. They are providing good value for a price. So there is no reason for me to leave. And so as an RA, if that is your mentality, that is how you drive advisor satisfaction. If you, if you realize every single day, you have to work hard to retain the advisors and keep them satisfied that are, that are on, on part of your team, that, that is going to that is gonna help, help uh, keep, keep the whole organization together so that advisors don't want to leave. But do not put up arbitrary roadblocks and say, if, I mean, if an advisor wants to leave because you're not providing good value or, or just simply they, they think a different path is now better for them at that stage in their career. That it's, do, do not put up arbitrary roadblocks. Again, unless you've formally acquired the practice, make it very clear the advisor is free to leave. The advisor is free to take their clients with them. Uh, mistake number six, uh, you try to punch above your weight. So what I mean by that is you, as you pick your, or as you kind of uh, lay out your defined offering, like I talked about at the top, as you come up with your value proposition, again, I encourage you to not try to be everything to everyone. You, you can't, if someone says, oh, what kind of advisors do you try to, oh, advisors, if you say, oh, advisors of all sizes and all geographies, all experience levels, all uh, investment focuses, again, that, that's not going to resonate with any advisor. And so as you, as you kind of pick what your defined offering is, but you also have to be realistic. So if you are an RIA and you have, I'm just gonna pick a number, 700 million in client assets, you, you likely are not going to be able to as easily attract in an advisor team that has 2 billion because they're gonna say, wow, we are much larger than you already. Perhaps as a result, we have more sophisticated client needs or, or, or whatever the case may be. And so th that's probably just not gonna be a good fit. You're, you're trying to punch above your weight. now. You know, the, the, the question is, okay, well, what happens if you're still a relatively smaller RA and you're trying to attract advisors in? And, and yes, it's a helpful from an operational perspective, a risk perspective, everything to have larger advisors on your team. But you, you have to be realistic. You can't just overnight have $100 million and think you're going to attract $600 million advisors into your office. Again, you're, you're, the, the story's likely not going to resonate. And just quite frankly, if you, if you punch too far above your weight, you probably haven't built out the needed resources and support uh, and, and the sophistication uh, needed to handle someone much larger. Now, one day when, when your firm itself is that much larger and all of a sudden you've, you've, you've refined your offer and you've refined your services, then, then you can certainly continue to grow larger and larger. But, but just be realistic of, of how quickly you try to grow and realistically, the kind of advisors you, you can attract into your firm at your current size. And know that, that that race kind of never ends. Even if you have a billion in assets or two billion, clearly a nice size uh, practice, well, there could be a $4 billion team at some wirehouse that, okay, they might not be a fit because even that's punching above your weight. And, and so there's, don't think, oh, well, I'll, I'll never get to the finish line because you won't. No, no firm gets to the finish line, but just know where you are at whatever point in time what is a good course uh, advisor profile that you can successfully 
uh, service and attract and just be realistic. And that might very well change over time as your own firm changes over time, but just always identify where that is and, and keep that as a focus. Uh, so the last mistake, mistake number seven, you don't know your competition. So what I mean by this is everything I've been talking about here, the, the profile of your practice, the value proposition, how you price it out, the services you're going to offer. Uh, you, you don't have to know about every other RIA out there because you, you wouldn't. There's, there's thousands and thousands of RIAs and they all have different value propositions. They all have different stories. But, but realistically, if you don't know how any other RIA prices their services when maybe trying to attract an advisor onto their team or how they package it up, you, you, you can't just take a blank piece of paper and assume you're going to nail it dead on and, oh, I'm going to be competitive with, with this offer. Now, an example with, with that would be uh, with your own investor clients. You, you don't need to be aware of how every other advisor in town uh, charges for their service, exactly what they charge, exactly what what's, uh, services they provide for the clients. But you do have to have a general idea of the going rate for fees charged to clients the, the, the average expectation of services that, that need to be provided for clients. Um, and, and you at least, by having a general idea, you can make sure that your offer, and again, this is as an advisor to your clients, is at least in that, in that spectrum of, of expectations out there. And so the same thing happens if you have an RIA or you're, again, future state have an RIA, you, you need to know, okay, what, what is the competition out there? How are they pricing this out? How are they packaging it out? You don't have to copy them perfectly. You don't have to mimic them, but you at least need to know what's out there so that you can ensure that you're competitive with what's out there. And you don't by any means have to be the lowest expense or the, the cheapest you, and you don't have to be the most expensive, uh, but, but you have to know kind of where that spectrum lies, what your value proposition is and what's realistic to charge considering what that value is and the services you plan to provide are. So again, know your competition uh, or not knowing your competition is mistake number seven. Uh, so with that, I, I hope this has been helpful. Again, for, for many of you, this might not even ever be applicable because maybe you have no intention of ever trying to attract advisors into your firm. Um, but even if that was the case with you, I think hopefully as an advisor yourself that might be thinking about maybe joining, a, a joining an existing um, RIA. And again, I did a, a whole separate episode on that. Uh, these are things you should be asking yourself too if you're looking at maybe joining a firm. How is it going to be priced out? What are the services? How are you different? And so equally important, if you are that advisor that wants to be on the other end of that attracting folks, these are the things you need to be thinking about. So I, I hope you found uh, this list helpful today. Uh, absolutely happy to talk this over with you if you would like. Uh, sort of thing I, I have conversations almost daily with about uh, advisors joining or attracting advisors, whatever the case may be, happy to have that conversation with you as well. Uh, so if you're not already there, if you head to transition to RIA.com, uh, like I said, you can find all of my resources, the video series, uh, the same series in podcast format, I have white papers, I have articles, uh, and at the top of every page is a contact link. If you click on that, you can instantly and easily schedule time to have a conversation with me, a one-on-one -on -one conversation, whether you want to talk about today's topic or anything else RIA related, I am happy to have that conversation with you. Again, transition to RIA.com. And with that, I hope you found value in today's episode and I'll see you on the next one.